we're going we're gonna to worship God today, and we're going to start off our worship with a uh, reflection on Black History Month. And so I would like uh, uh, Jackie to, to come forward. There you are. I was looking for you around. Where is Multitask. <laughs> Do you want the microphone, Jackie? <laughs> Follow the Lord Jesus Black History Month. It's Black History Month, and in classrooms around the country, children have been learning about famous African Americans and their contributions to our culture. That's a good thing, but there's one thing most kids have not been learning about many of these famous men and women. That is their Christian faith and how it motivated their lives and their work. For instance, Sojourner Truth is often identified as a women's rights advocate and abolitionist. <coughs> Overlook is the, is the source of Sojourner's fiery devotion to human rights. That was her commitment to Jesus Christ. The Lord gave me the name Sojourner, she declared, because I was to travel up and down the land, showing people their sins and being assigned to them. At age 88, her dying words were, follow the Lord Jesus. And then there's Rosa Parks. Many people know the story of the seamstress who helped ignite the modern civil rights movement. But far fewer people know that Parks was a devout Christian and that it was her faith that gave her the strength to do what she did that day in 1955. Since I have always been a strong believer in God, she says, I knew that he was with me and only he could get me through the next step, that is, refusing to give up her seat on the bus to a white man. Our kids have also been hearing a lot about Jackie Robinson's quiet, quiet dignity in the face of racial bigotry on the ball field. But many don't realize the source of Robinson's ability to turn the other cheek. It was his faith in Jesus Christ. During his 10 years with the Dodgers, he endured racist remarks, death threats, and unfair calls by umpires. But Robinson's faith helped him keep his anger in check. Every night he got on his knees and prayed for self-control. Most people know that George Washington Carver was a chemist and an ergonomist. Born a slave in 1860, Carver rose to become its director of agricultural research at Tuskegee University in Alabama. He is remembered for developing 118 derivative products from sweet potatoes and 300 from peanuts. Thanks to his efforts, by 1940, peanuts were the second largest cash crop in the South. But go to his name in the encyclopedia, and you'll find no reference to the most important aspect of his life, how his faith in God inspired his creativity. I didn't make these discoveries, Carver once said. God has only worked through me to reveal his children, to his children, some of his wonderful providence. Stories like these are a reminder of what a central role the Christian faith has played in the lives of many great Americans. We Christians need to reclaim our cultural heritage from those who seem intent on deleting it from history, from history books and from Black History Month celebrations. So I urge you, before the month ends, make sure your own kids learn about the body and faith of Sojourner Truth, Rosa Parks, Jackie Robinson, George Washington Carver, and of course, the Reverend Martin Luther King. Our kids deserve to know not only of African American contributions to science, politics, and culture, but also of those individuals' commitment to Christ. Amen. 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 Now, uh, you may be seated, although you're probably going to be up on your feet again very soon. We are so glad uh, that D.C. Grace uh, is here, and I call D.C. Grace forward now. Uh, 
Kim, and Frank, and Gloria, and Mike, and all of you that come forward and, and know that God is going to be using them in some powerful ways. Good morning, Saints. How are you? Good morning. You know, I was listening to this song. I remember that song, and I was just thinking about our inheritance that we had as God. Really God. Is your inheritance? Amen. 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 That's a greater inheritance. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. By faith, we've inherited God. Yes. Whoever God is, we have inherited him. And we are defined by his love. So no matter what goes on in the world, we know that God's love defines us. Amen. 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 So what do we inherit? Holiness, righteousness, and all that by who? The finished work of Jesus on the cross. God actually always saw us that way, but we see through the cross that those things are given to us really by faith, amen? amen. So while the hitler may have inheritance on the world, and we know that there's a fight down here, but actually, we've already won because of who? Christ. And he is the what? Reality, reality is finding Christ, so that's the real thing that's in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. amen. Isn't that awesome? This is the This is God, you actually inherited God. And everything. He's your father, right? Amen. He's your what? Your daddy? Yep. And your what? Your papa. papa. Amen. 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 <laughs> he's just not our God. He said he's Lord, King, he's all that. But you can call him Papa. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. Let's continue in an attitude of prayer. I think that <coughs> song put us in the right frame of mind for us to, to go to God and to <coughs> lift our prayers up to, to Him now. And uh, we did this kind of prayer the other day when the seminary students were here. But let's, let's all just say our prayers at the same time. Don't be afraid to speak them out. Don't be afraid if someone else is talking and you're talking. It, it, it's between you and God. Let's all go to God in prayer and see what a beautiful sound God creates as we pray together. As the Spirit leads you. Gracious and loving God, you are such an incredible God. We are so grateful for you. We are so grateful for your, your presence among us, Lord. Lord, we just want to sit with you. We want to be with you, Lord. We love you. We care for you. We are just here with you, God. Lord, come to us. Fill us. Fill this place with your spirit now, Lord. Be, be among us. May your spirit come to us and, and lift us to new heights. All this we pray, Lord. We are giving you thanks and praise for your presence with us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is and has been and is a wonderful thing to, to come together, to come together in worship and to be lifted in praise with such uh, beautiful music. Um, it's... Microphone. I think Mar Mar is over there waving to me. So. Um, the scripture today is from the prophet Jeremiah. And uh, it's, it's from the very beginning of his career. When, and it's about his call. His call to, to serve the Lord. And I want to, uh, let's read this. This is from the New Revised Standard Version. Now, the word of the Lord came to me. That's the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then Jeremiah's response was, Ah, oh, Lord God, 
Truly, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord said back to Jeremiah, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of God for us, the people. Please speak to God. Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet to the nations. He protested. He protested. He said, Ah, oh Lord, truly, I don't know how to speak, for I am only a boy. He was trying to find an excuse. And, and, and he protested, saying, you know, I'm not qualified. I'm only a boy. I, 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 I'm too young. Have you ever been asked to do something that was really, really awesome, but it scared the dickens out of you? I mean, you couldn't believe that you were asked to do this. It was such an honor to be chosen to do this. But, but, but being chosen, it, you know, it, it, it just, you realize, oh my goodness, why me? You know, uh, I, I've got new responsibilities in this. You know, uh, uh, I, I'm going to be on the spotlight. There's going to be all kinds of expectations of me. A few years back, I was asked to uh, give the baccalaureate address to the graduating class of Virginia Wesleyan College. And, and just five years ago, I was asked to do the same thing, give the baccalaureate address, address to my daughter's high school graduating class at West Potomac High School. And, and both times when I was asked, my initial response was to freeze. I mean... Wow, yeah, I'd love to do that. That's an awesome honor to, to be do that. I wasn't chosen. They just asked me to do that. But, oh, my goodness, I don't feel, do I really have something to say that these people can will find worthwhile listening to? I mean, what, is, what advice would I have to give was going through my mind? Actually, I did have some advice to give, but I didn't trust myself. You know, I, I, I didn't think that I could pull it off, and, 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 and I felt put upon, and, and, and I feared how I would be received. You know, would I fail or, or, or succeed in, in bringing something for this graduating class to hear? You know, we all hear God in small ways and big ways. You know, God's always calling us closer, always calling us deeper, always calling us to our destiny. Maybe God's calling you in different ways here at Rising Hope. You know, uh, some of you, God might be calling you to, to help serve Him in the food pantry or, or in the clothing closet. Some of you here, I know, have been called to, to, to lead Celebrate Recovery, to be our church council chair, to, to be our, our, our lay leader. You know, maybe you're being called to assist by being an usher or being a media tech. Um, you're being called 
for these tasks, not necessarily forever, but for a season. But still, still, we protest. It's almost a, a, a universal reaction that when God calls us, we might respond like Jeremiah. You know, uh, uh, Jeremiah who heard God's call and protested. Why me? He was afraid to speak out on behalf of God. He gives a lame excuse that he's not qualified because... He, he, he's way too young. When God has called you, what excuses have you used to protest, to say, God, I can't possibly be doing this? The story of Jeremiah is a reminder that when God calls, we are likely to be uncertain. Is this what he's really calling? Can I really do this? We're, you know, uh, we might be afraid of what it is that God is, is calling us to do. But it's also a reminder that God doesn't call to qualify. God qualifies the call. Think about that for a minute. God knows you. God created you. God gave you the abilities, the talents, the skills that you have. Would God ask you to do something that you weren't capable of doing? But still, we struggle. We stand in good company in that struggle. Jeremiah and Moses both protested God's call. Sarah laughed at the promise of children. Esther struggled to believe her place in history. But God knows us. God loves us. And God believes in our abilities. <coughs> I mean, God believes in our abilities. That's better than my mama believing in my abilities. You know? And your mother is such an encourager. But God, He believes in your abilities because he created you. God formed us in the womb. God longs for us to participate with him in doing good. And God invites us all to use our unique gifts to bring the reign of God here on earth. I, I, I guarantee you one thing. God's not merely calling you to come to church and sit in these pews. God's calling you to, to something much greater than that. You know, and, and, and God is calling you to something even bigger than, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, he might ask you to help out with the food pantry, he might ask you to help out with the clothing closet, he might ask you to, to lend a, a caring hand to, uh, to, to take in someone who's homeless. You know, God asks these things of us, but he also wants so much more. Because it's not these tasks, these things that we do that really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess uh, it's not these things that really justify us and make us who God wants us to be. We are made 
to be who God created us to be, when we live into His amazing love and unconditional grace. Amazing grace and unconditional love. Amazing love and unconditional grace. It's, it's all the same. He wants us to know the full extent of how much He loves and cares for you. And that is what will make the difference. When you have that kind of faith, God will fill you with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And you'll be excited. And, and, and people will see that there's something exciting about you. And when you have that kind of faith, God will work the fruits of faith in your life. It's not that you've got to go around proving yourself that you have faith. It just, the fruit just shows up in your life. Because you're living in that amazing grace. John Wesley said, it is fire, faith, and fruit. It's these that, that we can see the light, the faith, the love of God. And how that person has accepted that into their lives. By their faith, by their fire, and by their fruit. I mean, why wouldn't God give you the full extent of His grace? Why wouldn't He want you to live in that complete fullness? I mean, the Bible tells us that the goal of the Christian life is Christ-likeness. We follow Christ to become like Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we are being transformed into Christ-likeness. Romans 8.29 states that those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. But it even gets better than that. In Genesis 1, 27, we learn that we are created perfectly in the image of our Creator. And in Christ, we see what that perfect image looks like in Colossians 1, 15. Well, like Jeremiah, some people are called to be prophets. Ephesians 4 tells us some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. One thing's clear. While there may be specific roles and functions of leadership within the church, the purpose of the church is to equip us all for the work of ministry. We are all called to be ministers. Every one of us. If we believe in Christ, He's calling us to be a minister. To be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that, that He came to bring. Your calling and my calling is ultimately so much bigger than our job. Ultimately, our calling is to use whatever gifts and talents and skills God has given us to reflect the image of whom we are made in. To reflect the image of Christ. We are to repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's within our grasp. This is where our faith comes from. Do we have faith that we were really created in the image of God? You know, 
It's so easy to believe the devil's lies about us. It's so easy to believe that our sinful side is what really defines us. But Romans 6.11 tells us that in Christ we are dead to sin, but alive to God. Our spiritual journey is to grow in the faith of who we are in Christ. Our spiritual journey is to grow in the faith of who we are in Christ. It's in Christ Jesus that we see not only who God is, but in whose image we are made. In Christ Jesus, we see not only the man, Jesus, but we see the image of who God created us to be. Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You know, we may not readily see the image of Christ in our lives because we so easily see our, our sinful side. We so easily see our fallen nature. And that's really what the devil wants us to focus on. Yes, we sin, but we grow in the direction of what we are gazing on. If we focus on our sin, we're going to grow in that direction. If we focus on God and the clear understanding of who God created us to be, we will grow in that direction. Faith is believing in God in spite of the evidence of our fallen nature and then watching that evidence change. The kingdom of God is at hand, said Jesus. Repent and believe the good news. Ephesians 4 explains that the leaders of the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, they are to equip us all for uh, ministry and for building up of the church until all of us come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Do you hear that? We are being called to the full stature of Christ. It's no accident that you are here at Rising Hope and, and in this community on, along Route 1. And, and because you're here, you, I want you in all humility, humility to ask yourself, what does this mean? If God has called me to this community, this church, you know, uh, if God is calling me to the full stature of Christ. How am I to be Christ to my family, to my community, to my church, to my world? You know, telling this, it's, it's, it might be easy to protest. It might be easy to, 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 to say to God, oh God, you know, who, me? Why, why me? And you can come up with some excuse like, Jeremiah, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too disabled, you know, I'm too uh, strung out. Paul tells us in Philippians, let the same mind be in us, he says, let the same mind be in you, that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, that's heavy. That's heavy. 
And it's not something that I'm going to go around, oh good, I can't, I can't wait for this to happen. Even Christ had that moment where he asked God to take the cup of suffering away from him. From him. But he also prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And that's why Paul continues, continues showing us what, what the results are of this kind of love, love for one another. When he says, therefore God so highly exalted him, Christ Jesus, and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Hallelujah. to the glory of God the Father. Mm -hmm. Loving as Christ loved is how we are to live in the presence of God. In Ephesians, Paul tells us, to grow up and to grow into this presence. Paul says, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their, their craftiness and their deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. We are to grow up and grow into Christ from whom the whole body, that is the church, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Everything that God is calling the church to be, everything that God is calling you and me to be is out of love. Love for you, love for all of creation. We are called to be Christ in this world, to continue His ministry of proclaiming and professing and manifesting the will of God. That means we're called to live a life of unconditional love. We're called to live a life of righteousness and a life of justice. We're called to live exemplary lives so that when others look at us, they will see Jesus Christ. Two points I want to make. One, is we are not called to live this way out of obligation. God is not angrily demanding that we be good or else. We are called to live this way because this is how God created us. We were created this way. This is who we are. And our journey in faith is to get back to who God created us to be. The second point I want to make is you can't do that on your own. It's not a work that you can do and, and then feel like You've made it. You've arrived. It's the work of the Holy Spirit within you. When you have faith to believe that this is how God created you, as a matter of fact, this is who you really are, the work of the Spirit will begin. And you will have that fire. You'll have that fire to start living the way God created you to live. Then you will find the fullness. Then you will find the abundance. 
then you will find the satisfaction in life that you have been longing for. Stop make ex making excuses for yourself. God's calling you. He's calling you to a deeper faith. And it's not just a faith that believes that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, that you know, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What does Scripture say? Even the devil believes that. It's a, it's a faith that believes God created you perfectly. It's a faith that sees the unconditional love, the righteousness and love of God. It's a faith that sees God has put that in you. He made you to manifest His glory. He made you to sit with Him in the heavens and to rejoice over how good everything is. Believe it. Have the faith and the fire and the fruit will come out of that. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. When we know that, our lives will be transformed and God will begin to use us to transform the lives in this world. But don't say, as Jeremiah, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all whom I send you, says God. You shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them in the world, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.